Welcome to the New England Wildlife Center's guide to creating a successful online presence for dog shelters. Hey, Katrina, is that your dog on the cover? Yeah, that's Waffle. Isn't he great? <laughs> yes, he is. So who is the New England Wildlife Center and what is it that wildlife people know about dogs and dog shelters? Right, so New England Wildlife Center is a wildlife hospital and an education center, a science education center. But we're also a small nonprofit, and just like dog shelters, we need to communicate and reach out to our audience, both to educate and, of course, to raise money. So where do we start? Okay, so just like building your own organization physically, when you're starting out to build your organization virtually, you'll need a strong mission statement, reasonable goals, and a willingness to try new things. So our, our mission statement is to preserve New England's wild legacy through the administration of veterinary care, community engagement, and high quality science education. Mirroring your presence. Remember that you're creating a mirror image of yourself online. And really there's no one platform that's going to create your whole world. You're gonna need a Facebook page, a Twitter account, PayPal, or other social programs that you're gonna load, present, field, um, in order to share with your public. Hey, you see that dog in the mirror? Yeah, is that your dog? That's my dog. He's That's cute. That's Ted. Organizational interface symbiosis. You're going to find that the virtual shelter is going to influence the real shelter. That's expected, that your real shelter is going to be the model for the virtual one. What was unexpected for us was the influence that the virtual shelter has had on the real shelter. We have found that, that the virtual center has opened up new universes to us. It's opened up new populations of people, new subjects and uh, new concept, concepts that the, the real organization has been able to uh, get a hold of and begin to develop uh, inside our building. Creating a website. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks. So the first thing you're gonna need is a domain name. Okay. And it can be, it should really be as close to your organization name as you can get it. It should be short and should be easy to remember. So ours is any wildlife. And e-wildlife. And then the next part is your extension. And an extension is either .org, .com, .net. For a nonprofit organization, the extension is .org. Let me ask you a question. If I remember right, ours is any wildlife .org. Yes. And as you said, that's for nonprofits? That's right. That's for nonprofits. What happens if you accidentally do it and call it any wildlife .com? Is that a problem? <laughs> It's not a problem, and oftentimes nonprofits will buy up the other extensions so people don't get confused when they go online. It's just sort of more recognized that .org is a nonprofit, .com is a business, um, and .net is sort of all the leftovers. The next thing you're going to need is a web host. It's kind of like a street address. So New England Wildlife Center, our physical address is 500 Columbian Street, and that's where we live. Our website lives at a, a site hosted by GoDaddy, but there are many different uh, vendors. You can choose Rackspace, um, DreamHost. There's just the, the, the list is endless, and that's where all your data um, and website are stored. So this is the place that, that all of our information, as you just said, is, is stored somewhere. It's stored physically somewhere um, in a computer. That's right. That's right. Okay. Choosing your content management system. So there's two types, types of sites. You have static and dynamic. Static sites are usually designed by a web developer quickly. These sites provide basic facts about what your organization is. The only thing about static sites is you can't change them. You need a professional web person to change them and that can be expensive. A dynamic site is initially designed by the web developer but it enables your organization to update the content, photos, uh, and to sort of manage the system. It saves you time and money. That was a huge thing for us. When our, when our web developer suggested this idea, it suddenly opened up doors and windows for us uh, to actually do on-site. And so we, we sort of entered a world of being completely dynamic. 
as we got new thoughts, new plans, new programs, we were able to put them right onto the website without setting up an appointment and having a meeting and talking about what the new content was going to be. That's right. And also a, a dynamic model, a dynamic blog model, they call it as well, um, drives significantly more visitors and traffic to your site because you're updating your content constantly. If I remember right, it's like 475% more traffic on a dynamic site. That's right. Yeah, that's great. Selecting a theme and flow dynamic. Okay, so think of your website like a skeleton. If you look at our website, the top and the side are our skeleton. All of our most important data can be found going left to right or top to bottom. So this is kind of like a table of contents on a front page so that people can search for information on your site? Yes, it presents sort of your hierarchy in a way that's intuitive and matches your own conceptions of yourself. Choosing your webmaster. Oh boy, this is an important one. You really gotta think of your website as a living organism. It needs constant attention, improvements, updates, and care to grow and thrive. So choosing a dedicated web developer is paramount to your website's success. This is as important as choosing a, a staff person. This Absolutely. Is as, this is like uh, choosing your assistant director. Um, it sure is. If you choose the person, uh, the wrong developer, it can waste time, waste money, and you can get a product that doesn't even match what your physical organization looks like. The personality of the person uh, that you choose is important. Their temperament is important, and their ability to communicate. Um, I would say the, the ability to communicate with the client is as important as their ability to design a web page. Absolutely, absolutely. And I gotta say for the New England Wildlife Center, we have had the, the, the best uh, webmaster possible. We sure have, her name's Unia Cowell. Yeah, and uh, it has made a huge difference in how flexible and how fast we're able to function uh, in the virtual world. Personnel training, site updates and comment moderation. Consistent tone, just like Libel over here is sitting very <laughs> nicely. <laughs> we have to have a consistent tone when we're updating um, material and presenting material on our website. Um, the delivery style has to match that that, uh, that is in our, our physical center. And the way that we achieve this is by choosing one person who has really good writing skills, who's a friendly people's person, um, but really someone who embodies what the mission is of your organization. And so, in, so in real life, this is kind of a backward analogy, if you're using different kinds of fonts and different font sizes, you, you're not consistent and it becomes very confusing for people and you just need a um, content material that is sort of on the same thinking process every time so people recognize it and they become at ease. Uh, That's right. So to it's find they'll there'll be a pattern. They'll notice the fonts that you're using. They'll notice the colors you use, the schemes you use. But really, for us, what was most important was the tone, the tone um, of, voice of what and how we were, were used. Answered. Yes, yeah. exactly. There becomes like for New England Wildlife Center. There's a sort of friendly, upbeat. Hey, just wanted you to know. And this is informational. And we've tried to cut down on the number of folks who do update content until they learn what our particular tone is yeah well, I know I know for the Wildlife Center again um, we get comments on our page and uh, having an even hand which by the way is you Katrina you're the person who responds to those and having an, an even hand uh, in your responses uh, keeps the conversation uh, focused it keeps the conversation on on uh, content uh, and things don't Things don't drift away from what your real mission is. That's right. Design and information mm. architecture. Now it's time to flesh out the skeleton. Okay, so first you want a clear philosophy and mission statement on the home page. If you look at our home page, ours is NEWC, Preserving New England's Wild Legacy. You want to know your audience and, and the experience that you want to provide for them. And one of the things that happens, though, is we discovered there were new audiences that we couldn't predict. Even though we need to know who our audience is, it also takes in other people. Right, number three is 
What would you like to accomplish with your website? Do you want to raise money? Do you want to educate people? Do you want to do both? Do you want to give information to people about how they can adopt a dog? And the fourth thing is you want it to be easy to navigate. So when someone goes on our page and they want to make a donation, right in the front page it says donate. Um, if you want to find out how to adopt, uh, how, if you want people to find out how to adopt an animal, you want to have that clear um, and pleasant looking right on the front page. The fifth thing you'll need is a clear and visible call for action. And like I just mentioned, donate. The other one is, if you look at our page, we have a bright um, tab for volunteer. So people can, come, when they come to your page, they should be able to look at it and act. Be able to say, okay, I want to do something and have it be readily available for what, um, for what you anticipate they might want to do. Give money, adopt, come and visit. Six is you'll need this, lots of pictures of people and animals. This is a long list. It's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of must-dos in the web world. Uh, it should be stunning visually. When you look at a site, the colors should match. It should invite you in. It should be easy to contact someone. It should be very donor-friendly. It should be very volunteer-friendly. Uh, it should also be linked to social media. It what do you mean be, by social media? Uh, remember, again, social media are things like Twitter, Facebook, um, there's a whole variety of different social media. We use Facebook and Twitter, and those are connected in on our website. It should be press media friendly. What does um, that mean? Well, on our website, one of the things we're now designing is a page just for the media. So that anytime there's a story that is, is either about New England Wildlife Center or about wildlife or about animals in general, the media can just go to that page and they know there'll be information to download, pictures, photos, press releases, um, that they can get their hands on very easily. Okay. Yeah. The next thing you need is a calendar for upcoming events. The calendar is the most visited section on our website. So we like to keep that up to date and let people know what's happening. And the 14th thing is the window dimensions and page layout. You really need to pay attention to those because you want, those are the things that are going to hold people's attention and keep them there. And those are the things you really want to rely on your webmaster for. Content. So these are the four types of content, Greg, that people find most appealing and share the most. Why don't you read them to us? Okay, well, the one on the far left is it's all about education and the photo reflects that then we have an inspiring category and our photo reflects that too that's a hummingbird um, so that's a hummingbird that we released uh, sitting on a spoon drinking um, hummingbird syrup out of the spoon another category is that it needs to be interesting it needs to be something that's going to capture people's imagination and uh, in this particular instance, it's, uh, w we, we installed a, an, an esophagostomy tube on a snapping turtle. Uh, and so we explained that, that content. Those are the kinds of things for our audience really captures people's imagination. And then cute, cute, cute. Cute works in the world of animals. Style of presentation. Consistency is key. You want, again, to make sure your fonts, your lettering, your logo, and your color choices match your in-house styles. You want to make your photos and graphics the same sizes. Keep the styles and fonts consistent throughout the entire page. It's just easier for people to read and people are more likely to stay on your website when, they, when it's easy for them to see, follow, and read. It needs to be easy on the eyes. You want your site to engage, not distract. So avoid fast-moving graphics. Avoid using more than three primary colors. And make sure you use photos to serve as a purpose, not just to be there because it just adds clutter. SEO strategies. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. By paying attention to certain areas of your site and employing a few simple techniques, your site will be more visible on the web. So what does this mean? This means when somebody has a search engine, or they're looking up on Google or Bing or uh, one of the other search engines, this is a way of optimizing? Is that what we're talking about? That's right, Greg. Actually, it's a way of what you want to do is you want your site to come right to the very top when you Google it or when you search for something on Bing or another uh, search engine. You want New England Wildlife Center to be right at the top. And for those of you listening, you want your organization or your dog shelter to be right on the top. So these are the ways to help do that. The seven most powerful tools are 
keywords. The keywords are the, are the weirds. It, they are what they sound like. And these are the most important words to your organization and uh, any of the subjects that you happen to be dealing with. And if you want them to rise, if you want your uh, site to rise high in searching, uh, you're going to use a lot of keywords. So you mean like the Wildlife Center is really interested in raccoons. So on our website, we use the word raccoon a lot. Yes. And so when somebody um, types in a word into their search engine, raccoon, they're going to come to New England Wildlife Center's page. Because raccoon, the word raccoon is repeated so many times that it rises to the top of the top of the search. And becomes a keyword. And becomes a keyword. Ah. So the second is incoming links. When other people, other organizations um, link to your website, that makes your search engine um, optimization higher. I'll so this is a sort of an internet, uh, this is a, a, a uh, uh, sounds a little bit political. In other words, if you can get other organizations to link to you, that's going to make you rise higher in the search? That's right, because it makes your site more important, for lack of a better word. So if our, for example, we have a good relationship with our sister organization, Animal Rescue League, and they have a link to our site on their site. Additionally, outgoing links also help to rise our SEO. Outgoing links are things we link to on our website. So we have a link to Animal Rescue League's website on our website. So to go back with the first example of Raccoon, um, if we linked if we have outgoing links, meaning that we as an organization, our web page is actually linking to other raccoon organizations, that will drive us higher uh, in the search engine optimization too. Is that right? It doesn't really matter what which way you go. Exactly. So internal linking, now that's when you link, you put a, a link from um, one of your pages to one of your posts or one of your posts to one of your pages. Um, and that also raises up your optimization. Two of the most powerful tools uh, for site optimization are having folks from a .gov extension or .edu extension uh, driving people to your site. So if, for example, the state of Massachusetts, which is a .gov uh, site, sends people to your website, that's going to make the, um, your website uh, search engine optimization search engine optimization higher. Same for colleges and universities, which are .edu sites. When they link, like if Harvard and MIT and Roxbury Community College are all linking to your website, that they are .edu sites, and that helps your rating as well. Titling all of your images. That's just a very important search um, engine optimization. Also, the loading speed of your site. So the just to go back to titling, so by titling your images, you're actually uh, increasing the number of times that a, that a keyword may pop up. That's right. That's okay. exactly right. Okay. And then le loading speed? What, what controls how fast y you load into a search? Well, the amount of information that you have on your web page and how many photos you have and how, what size they are um, affect the speed in which your pages load. The loading speed of your site is in part controlled by the size of the photos that you're using. And as Katrina just said, this, the, our, we try to limit our, our total number of pixels to around 600 uh, in any one direction in, our, in, our, uh, uh, in a photo. When you take a photo, that photo may be taken at 12, 35, 4,800 pixels um, in a direction, which is a lot of information that slows the search process down. And when you decrease the total number of pixels to a 600 by 600 picture, then it loads a lot faster. And the search engine, I guess Google, picks it up, or, or another search engine, picks it up much more quickly. And the faster it loads, the higher up in the ranking you're going to be uh, when somebody search for, searches for your subject. Yes, yeah, so content volume. The amount of uh, material and information that you, are, that you have on your site um, gives you a higher ranking. So if there's a lot of content and there's a lot of material worth reading on your site, you're going to get a better listing on Google. Principles. Fundraising through your website is complicated. There's no magic words. Just like fundraising in the real world, your online solicitation requires smart tactical and strategic decisions and resource development. The advantage of the online 
fundraising is that there are a lot of tools and innovations that you can tap into. So it's just as hard to work as fundraising anywhere else in the world. It is, and you've got to find your niche. What works for your organization isn't necessarily going to work for another person's organization. E-solicitation. Building an online donor base is essential to any nonprofit's viability in the new economy. Constructing a core group of sustaining donors is really your ultimate goal. Emails are like gold when it comes to online giving. They not only help in soliciting donors, but they allow you to track ongoing relationships, update your funders on organizational news, and set the stage for special asks and events. Collect those emails wherever you can. So the, the email is the core. The email is the, the central thing you need to, get, you need to gather. Well, I mean, yes, because emails are the way you're going to be able to get in touch with your donors. You want to communicate with them, keep them up to date on what's happening, and ask them for money. Okay, that sounds perfect. Constant contact. Constant contact is one of the many, many e-marketing tools that you can use to send newsletters, to solicit people, to send thank yous, and to send other correspondence, pictures, links to media coverage to your audience. It's simple and it's cheap. And there's a lot of them. Constant contact is what we use, but you may choose to use a different vendor. It's really important in constant contact that when you collect those emails, you have permission from the person whose email it is. Um, that's the legality of the situation, and you don't want to get more spam because then you can be dropped from your marketing program. So what does that mean? You, you, if, if you have to have permission from the person who's providing you the email so that you can have a constant contact, so you can have a constant send of photos That's and right. information. So, so what you want to do is you want to ask the person, hey, Bill, can I have your email? And if Bill says, sure, you can have my email, then you can enter Bill's email in and send him asks and um, newsletters, etc. Now, if someone tells you, oh, I have a list of names, would you like to borrow my list? Would you like to use my list? You cannot. Um, you have to have the donor's permission or the contact's permission to use their email. So that, that email originates with your organization? That's right. You're oh, e the way New England Wildlife Center does it is we run a commercial veterinary practice, so we ask any clients to come in if they'll give us their email. At the front desk, we ask people for, our, for their email. Um, dog shelters can certainly ask anyone who's adopting or surrendering an animal for an email. We ask for emails at events. We ask for emails at trade shows. Everywhere we go, we're thinking email, email, email. Yeah, I've seen you and uh, some of our volunteers at events. We have this pumpkin event, and they walk around, people walk around with clipboards just approaching hundreds of people in line uh, asking them for their email. Targeted group marketing. Mega multipliers, YouTube, blogs, traditional print, broadcast media, and social media can drive potential donors to your website. Remember, always tag everything you write with your website address. That means if you're on TV, ask the anchor to give you a website address. On Facebook, when you post, put your website address. When you're blogging somewhere, make sure you include your website address. We use our website address on our on our invoices. When we give a bill to somebody, we automatically, or if they donate something to us, they get our website. Our business cards have our website uh, printed on it so people know where to go to, to find it. Media drivers. Remember, all paths should lead you home. Your home is your website. It's where every request for a donation should lead. So if you're in the news, you're in the Patriot Ledger, like you see in the bottom left corner, you want that to tell folks to go to your website. If you are, your YouTube videos that you post should send people to your website. If you're, if you manage to land one of the so-called mega multipliers, you want to send those folks to your website. Anything on your Facebook you post should lead to your website. Twitter should lead to your website. Everything on all paths should lead you home because that's where the donations are going to be made. That's where folks can give you your email and subscribe for your newsletter, and that's where people can make that online donation and become a monthly donor. Payment infrastructure. Having a secure and easy to use system for collecting donations is critical. We happen to use PayPal, but there are many, many others that you can use making sure that your donors are confident that their information is going to be protected is very important and 
you want to you want to eliminate any obstacles to people in making a donation to your organization. So having a trusted payment source is very important. And those get embedded into your website, into your newsletters, into Facebook and other web outlets. Statistical analysis. Your web presence is going to generate an overwhelming amount of data. Some of it's really cool. Like we found out in Google Analytics on our website that folks were looking at our page from Saudi Arabia. Um, so a lot of it is really interesting and totally useless. So you need to look through it, explore it, and then decide which metrics work for you. You want to set benchmarks and goals and start to refine those and start to look into different ways of doing things to optimize your web traffic. The more traffic you get, the more likely you are that some is going to stop and make a donation. Opinion leaders appeasing the rating agencies. One of the key factors in creating a virtual presence is maintaining organizational integrity, just like you do in your real organization. Agencies like Charity Navigator, GuideStar, Yelp, Angie's List, and others assign a rating to your organization based on your structure, your policies, your budget. And everyone uses different standards, which can be difficult. Donors see these ratings, so you need to make sure you know what they're saying about you as well. And if something's inaccurate, you can contact the rating agency and change it, or you can try to um, accommodate and meet whatever, um, whatever information those particular agencies want. Education on the Internet. The opportunities for education on the Internet are profound. If you have the tools to create a web page or to create a social media page, you have the tools to create educational content. There are two categories of educational content uh, that are important in creating a web page and also in, in any of your social media pages. One is that you're, you're, you're teaching people about your organization. And the other is that you're, you're promoting the subject area that, that you're interested in. So there's, there's two main broad categories. Any information that you put on the, on the page is going to tell people something. You, even a blank page tells something about your organization. So can you give us some guidance? Well, there's, there's a number of things you want to keep in mind. And probably the first, just like in, in real life, uh, the first is you want to keep it concise and simple. And you want to choose three facts and maybe one concept that you want your user to achieve. Another uh, guideline is you want to develop your information first and then adapt it. Each media outlet will have a slightly different flavor and audience. So adapt your delivery to match each of them. But first, you need to know what facts and concepts you're sending out first and then, then adapt it later. And then the, the third one, and each one of these is really important, but this is a, I think this may be the most important, and that is pictures drive home the point. Your pictures are going to captivate people. If you have well done photographs or images, that's what's going to capture people to read more about the organization. Like in fundraising, your web page should act as your main educational platform. Now make sure that all of your educational outlets drive people back to your page first and then to your other outlets. In other words, the web page is the central place where all of your education is going to take place. That's going to be the education about who you are as an organization and then also about the facts and concepts that you're trying to teach them. You can do this by hosting as much of the content as possible on your site and ending every post with a tagline that entices people to learn more about who you are and about your subject by visiting. Much of what you're going to say should be said in photographs. Um, we're not photographers. Well, you are, Greg. Well, I'm an amateur photographer. In other words, you don't have to be a professional photographer to have great content. But there's just a couple of simple-minded uh, concepts you need to keep in mind when you when you load something onto your web page or your social media. And the first is you really don't want blurry photos. Blurry photos, eh, people look at it, they don't understand what they're looking at, and they go on to something else. They'll, they'll leave your, your page. And you can see the first photo we have here is pretty blurry. Uh, the light's not right, and you can't really see what it is we're photographing. Another thing you probably is a, a do not 
is uh, don't photograph from above. Uh, I mean, here and there, a from above photograph will, will work. Uh, but you see here, you see that the dog is in the weeds. You, know, you can't really see what he's doing. But if you take a level shot, or sometimes a slightly upward shot, uh, you get a much better photograph of what it is you're, you're trying to, whatever your subject is. Uh, if you can have a uniform background in the back, uh, like the sky or a, or a uniform uh, grassy field or even a woodland, just the woodland behind it, uh, it makes a much better understandable photograph. And then two last, thing is, two last things, you don't want a cluttered photograph. You see an, an example here of a dog laying with a lot of junk just laying around it. So you're not sure what the photograph is about. Is it the aquarium? Uh, is it the bicycle? Is it the dog? Is you know it it distracts from what the viewer is trying to uh, uh, understand. And then um, we have an example here of a fairly clear shot, which is Waffle, who you saw on the uh, the front page, uh, and he is curled up on a chair. And I think it connotates exactly what what we're trying to achieve. And so videos, I guess, Greg, are sort of like pictures. Um, they're a whole different kettle of fish, but the same principles apply. You want to make sure it's clear. You want to make sure it's simple. Uh, and you want it to really promote um, the organization and the message that you're trying to get across. But there's a couple of things to keep in mind here, too. And one is you don't want a blurry video. You also don't want a camera that shakes. You don't want a camera that moves from subject to other subject too quickly. So you have to keep your video camera really still, and um, you want your, your, whatever you're focusing on, whether it's a dog, sort of primary, primary center uh, part of the photograph. You don't want them off in the corner. I know you always say, too, that make sure that the video isn't too long so you don't bore people, and to try not to cover too much material in your video. Exactly right. Fast videos, simple videos achieve more. More videos are better than too long of a video trying to cover all that that information. What about then, music in your video? Is that a good idea? Some people like music, some people don't. Um, I, I happen to like music when it's especially when it's paired to an animal. But there are some uh, there are some people, just realize some people think that it's a little contrived when you're putting music to to animals. So again, I guess it sort of goes back to what we said about fundraising and education on the web. It, Whatever works for your organization, one thing will work for one, and one will work for another. For another, yeah, and you have to you have to find your own style, and uh, promote your style, and try to keep your style consistent. Um, that doesn't mean you can't innovate, but nevertheless, um, a consistent style will keep the reader engaged and understanding what it is that you're you're trying to promote. There's two other things we need to talk about with video. And um, the, the one is you want to be careful that there's not a lot of sound in the background. We've been fooled a couple of times by putting a video up and not realizing that there's people talking in the background. And you don't want to get caught saying things on, on, on a media site that you weren't expecting to be saying to the, to the public. So just always be aware that there's a sound button uh, in the process of creating the video. The other one is we have found that it's really easy to take an intelligent tablet like an iPad and use that as the camera. It's a really fast, simple way to do it. There's already software built in that allows you uh, to compress your videos uh, and to load it directly onto your website without a lot of, lot of hassle, without a lot of editing and, and uh, uh, other software applications you need. So intelligent tablets uh, of, of, of a number of different brands really work as being the, the mechanism for uh, getting a good, good video. This is kind of a, an interesting concept. I mean, everything that we've, we've worked with uh, so far has been, has been uh, static or has been canned, meaning that the information is loaded onto the website or um, in the case of a video, it's, it's loaded on, but it's, it's the same thing repeated over and over. But virtual outreach, it becomes real time. It becomes like being on live TV. And we're beginning to use this a lot in education, and it's a very effective tool in connecting people in real time back to um, the organization. And it can be used in classrooms. It can also be used with donors. It can be used uh, 
with uh, individual, um, in, let's say somebody was trying to adopt a dog and they, they can't travel uh, too far to, to see, they can see it through the, uh, the real time of the, of the camera. There's a number of different programs that allow you to do that. Uh, there's Skype, there's FaceTime, uh, Google has, a, has one of their own. And what this means is that there's a camera on, this is, this is the, the television phone. There's a live camera on uh, the people at the center or at your organization, and then there are people out in the community who are talking to you. And here you have a photograph of a group of students talking to another group of students with Looks a like dog. Looks like they're talking to a dog. Well, they're talking to a dog, and they're talking to uh, uh, a, a, a person who is the dog handler. Hey, that's my dog. That is your dog. He looks great. <laughs> He's got a big nose. Virtual outreach can be thought of as a portable window into your facility, allowing students, donors, and the general public to catch a glimpse of what you're all about without ever actually setting foot into your organization. The format dissolves the boundaries of static education. There is an inherent flexibility, flexibility built right in. If someone has a question or wants to see more of something, responding comes as simple as walking the ob over to the object in question and pointing a camera at it. And again, I, I can see in a dog shelter, this is a great way to, to develop uh, adoptions. Uh, in other words, somebody calls and is interested, they can actually FaceTime you or Skype you and get linked right into you and you can walk your iPad or your intelligent tablet down to that very dog and show them a live picture of, of who that dog is. Who are those kids in the classroom? This is a, uh, this is a great concept where we are actually sitting in a classroom and uh, Zach, who's my son, is teaching the students in the classroom about a subject in biology. And the classroom is in the community and they are, as you can see, have their hands up because they're asking a question. But they're not asking a question of Zach, they're asking a question of the presenters that are on the video screen. Aren't those our interns? And those are our interns in the hospital who have in their lap little baby animals. And they're explaining the biology of the baby animals to the students. And of course, this electrifies the students because they have lots of questions. It's like they're taking a field trip without ever leaving the classroom. And the cool thing, the really effective thing about this is if they have taken the field trip to your center or to your shelter first and then they reconnect with you in the classroom it's that that field trip relives over and over in the uh, the hearts and the curiosity of the students thank you greg this has been great you know after everything's all said you do have a very cute dog <laughs>